This episode of Messed Up Origins was brought to you by Raycon. What is going on Solo fam? My name is John Solo and this is Messed Up Origins, the show where I track your favorite fables and fairy tales through history and break down their disturbing backstories. And today on Messed Up Origins, we're covering a story that I've been seeing a ton of requests for lately, Thumbelina by Hans Christian Andersen. Even if you're not that familiar with the fairy tale, you've definitely heard of Thumbelina, the fairy princess that's about that big, hence the name. She's a creation of Hans Christian Andersen's whose original stories we've talked about multiple times on this channel. And just like those stories, Anderson wove some of his own personal struggles into Thumbelina's adventure. Before we break all that down, we're going to do a quick summary of the animated film from 1994, which seems to be how the majority of you guys know the story, because I want it to be fresh in the head of those who haven't seen it in a while. But first, I want to give a little shout out to Raycon for sponsoring this episode. Now, you may already be familiar with Raycon and their amazing wireless earbuds because they've sponsored the show before, but if you're not, listen up because you're going to want to hear this. Raycon is a company that was founded by the rapper Ray J because he was sick of premium audio being so damn expensive. He and a bunch of audio engineers came together to make some incredible wireless earbuds that are half the price of other top shelf brands with even better quality. These headphones have next level audio drivers, extra bass, are resistant to sweat and water, and actually fit comfortably in your ears. Their earbuds have a crazy long battery life too, up to 24 hours with a charging case, and there's a variety of colors you can choose from. If you want to follow my lead and get yourself a pair, just go to buyraycon.com solo or click my link in the description and take early advantage of their Black Friday and Cyber Monday deals. And now, Solo fam, it's time we get started. Make sure to give this video a big fat thumbelina up. I know, that was lame. Let's move on. Subscribe to have new content like this in your sub box every week. Most importantly, enjoy. So the movie opens with a swallow singing a song about love, then telling us the story of Thumbelina, which starts with a lonely woman desperately wanting a child and getting her wish granted by a witch. The woman plants a piece of barley corn the witch gave her and a tulip sprouts, revealing a little lady inside. The woman names her new daughter Thumbelina, loves her dearly, and provides a great life for her, but the little lady soon becomes depressed that she doesn't know any other tiny people like herself. Coincidentally, that night, a fairy prince comes to visit her, and after a bumblebee ride that suspiciously similar to a certain magic carpet ride, the two fall in love and agree to get married. Unfortunately for Thumbelina, she gets kidnapped by Mother Toad who wants her to marry her son Grundle. Yeah, his name is Grundle, before the fairy prince can return the next night. Thumbelina escapes the toad's clutches with the help of the swallow Giacomo, but then ends up in the clutches of a beetle who kicks her to the curb a few hours later because his beetle friends find her ugly. Luckily, she runs into Giacomo after this and he agrees to take her to the Vale of Fairies, where the prince lives, but while he's out asking for directions, he winds up with a thorn in his wing and leaves Thumbelina stranded for the winter. She survives thanks to a pushy field mouse providing her shelter, but the mouse also informs her that the fairy prince Cornelius was found for frozen dead. Little does she know, the frozen prince was saved by some jitterbugs and was doing his best to reach and rescue her this whole time. Then, she introduces our heroine to her neighbor, the rich and sophisticated Mr. Mole, who of course also wants to marry Thumbelina. Well, luckily enough, in one of Mr. Mole's tunnels was a near-frozen Giacomo, who Thumbelina was able to nurse back to health so he could go back to looking for the Vale of Fairies. Cut to Thumbelina's wedding day. She's almost forced into marrying Mr. Mole, but at the very last second, she refuses and runs away. After Thumbelina escapes from the mole's tunnels, she is once again scooped up by Giacomo, who brings her to the Vale of Fairies, where she reunites with her one true love. In the end, Prince Cornelius marries Thumbelina, she's given her own set of wings, and according to Giacomo, the two live happily ever after. Can you believe that Roger Ebert actually said in his review that it's difficult to imagine anyone over the age of 12 finding much to enjoy in Thumbelina? because I can. No disrespect to anyone who likes it, of course. I'd probably be fond of it too if I saw it when I was a kid, but as a 25 year old in 2019, I can confirm this movie is objectively meh. And to the smart bags commenting that Thumbelina wasn't made by Disney, I am fully aware of that, but Disney owns 20th Century Fox now, and you can stream the movie on Disney Plus, so that's why this is Disney Explained. Anyway, I'm sure you guys are more than ready for me to dive into the original story by now, so let's do it. 
So Thumbelina was first published back in 1835 in the second installment of Anderson's Fairy Tales Told for Children collection. It was the first of three stories in this installment, with the other two being The Naughty Boy and The Traveling Companion. Only back in Anderson's home country of Denmark, it wasn't called Thumbelina. It was called Tamalisa, and Tamil is Danish for thumb. In English, he wasn't actually given the name Thumbelina until H.W. Dolkin's translation in 1864, 29 years after the original. Prior to that, other translators called her Little Ellie and Little Toddy, which I have to say are far worse choices. Now the story opens in a similar fashion to the movie. There's a peasant woman who is desperate to have a child, so she seeks help from a fairy who gives her a special barley corn seed to plant. The woman goes home and plants the seed and immediately a red and gold tulip sprouts. She kisses the flower just like in the movie and it opens up to reveal a tiny little lady inside. That little lady was half a thumb tall and was thus called Thumbelina. Now Thumbelina had a pretty nice life with the peasant woman, but it's all taken away from her when a fat, ugly toad kidnaps her to be her son's wife. When she got back to her toad home, she had her son put the walnut Thumbelina was sleeping in on a lily pad in the middle of the pond so she couldn't escape. When Thumbelina woke up in the strange place, she was terrified and started to cry. Then when the toad mom came over and said she was gonna have to marry her ugly son, she cried cried even harder. Fortunately, some passing fish heard the situation going down and didn't want to leave poor Thumbelina to this horrible fate, so they chewed through the lily pad stem and sent her free floating down the stream. Remember that in the movie, it's Giacomo who sets her free and some other animals come to their aid when they approach the waterfall. Now, with the help of a white butterfly, Thumbelina floats freely for a while before she's snatched up by a beetle who takes her to his place to meet his beetle friends. But as it turns out, his friends find the beautiful Thumbelina hideous, mostly because she's not a beetle, so he just dropped her off on a daisy somewhere and told her to kick rocks. Thumbelina was now alone and scared in the middle of what, to her, was a massive forest, and she barely made ends meet throughout the rest of summer and spring, surviving only by eating honey and drinking dew off plants. The winter came soon enough, and Thumbelina took shelter with a field mouse, who said she could stay there as long as she needed, but she'd basically be her live-in housekeeper. It was generous, but the mouse proved herself to be pretty weird pretty fast, and she kept pushing for our heroine to marry her neighbor, Mr. Mole, because he was rich bitch intelligent, had a big house, and wore nice furs. This is despite Thumbelina insisting that she wasn't interested in marrying a disgusting mole creature. It wasn't just because he was ugly though, she wasn't that shallow. The mole would also always disparage on the things Thumbelina liked the most, like the sun, the flowers, and the birds singing. Their personalities just didn't match up well. And speaking of birds, one day while the three were walking through the mole's tunnels, he showed them a dead frozen swallow he found. As you probably guessed, this is what inspired the Giacomo character in the movie, only in the story, this is the first time Thumbelina sees him. Both the mole and the mouse pass by the bird's carcass without much of a care, but Thumbelina felt horrible for the poor thing, so that night when she couldn't sleep, she returned to the bird with a blanket of hay and covered it up. Well, as it turns out, the bird wasn't dead, just frozen stiff from the cold winter, which it couldn't migrate away from because it had a thorn in its wing. Thumbelina cared for the swallow all winter, and when spring came along, she opened up a hole in the tunnel ceiling and set the bird free. To those wondering why she didn't leave with him, she really, really wanted to, but felt bad abandoning the field mouse without a goodbye. She ends up regretting this decision though, because when she returns, she's told the mole asked to marry her, and the mouse agreed on her behalf. Then, when Thumbelina said she didn't want to marry that freak, the mouse threatened to bite her with her sharp white teeth. And so Thumbelina had no choice but to bide her time, watching the mouse and mole make preparations until that fall when her wedding day had finally arrived. She was trying to cope with the fact that the mole was going to take her deep underground, never to see the sun again, so she sat at the front door the field mouse's house to mire the landscape. And while she was standing there appreciating the flaming ball of gas millions of miles away, her old friend the swallow suddenly appeared. She told the swallow that she did not want to marry the mole, so once again he offered to bring her elsewhere, somewhere that's warm for the winter, and she accepted. After soaring over massive forests, snowy mountains, and rolling hills, they arrived at their destination, a big white mansion with a beautiful garden. Thumbelina picked out a flower for the swallow to drop her off at, but when she got there, she was surprised to see a tiny little man standing at the center. He was shiny and transparent, as if he were made of crystal, had a gold crown on his head, and tiny wings on his back. It turns out that he was the angel of the flower. A tiny man and woman live in every flower, and he was the king of them all. Just as fairy tales usually go, this was love at first sight. The little man took the gold crown from his head, placed it on Thumbelina's, and asked if she would be his wife and queen over all the flowers. Now this was quite the upgrade from the toad and mole, so she said yes instantly. Soon she was married to the flower king, was given a set of wings of her own, as well as a new name. 
Maya. Because according to the king, Thumbelina was too ugly of a name for someone so beautiful. The swallow then sang them their wedding song and they lived happily ever after. And now for one last detail, it's implied at the end of the story that Anderson himself is the one who owned the large white house that Thumbelina moved to and that he was told her story by the swallow. And this detail is mirrored in the movie through Giacomo telling the audience the story. Pretty crafty. So as you can see, while the movie was mediocrity personified, it actually followed the plot of the story pretty closely. Some of the biggest changes were that she meets the prince in the first act, that her suitors are present throughout the entire adventure, and that her mom attends her wedding, whereas in the book, her mom loses her to the toad, then never sees her again. Which now that I think about it, is pretty depressing. She wakes up one morning to learn that her brand new baby she just bought a few days ago is missing, then is left to assume she was either kidnapped by the Rice Krispie elves or lying dead in a footprint somewhere. Outside of the two attempted arranged marriages under the threats of death and severe violence, that might be the most messed up aspect of the story. Now, like the rest of Hans Christian Andersen's tales, Thumbelina was an original. Conceptually, he did take inspiration from other stories featuring small characters like Tom Thumb and Gulliver's Travels, but the plot itself was all him. Which begs the question, were there any real life factors that influenced this story like so many of his others? Well, according to Jackie Wolschlager, who wrote what might be the best biography ever written on Andersen, the answer is yes. If you've watched the show for a while now, you should already be familiar with this, but Andersen's childhood was full of struggle. On top of being dirt poor, he was a young lad with non-traditional interests like music, art, and poetry, and I hate to say this, but he was also pretty goofy looking. These imperfections were enough in the eyes of Anderson's peers to ridicule and ostracize him, and as a result, he always felt like an outsider. Thumbelina was the first of Anderson's stories to dramatize the struggle of being different from everyone else and the object of their mockery. Not only was she alone in the harsh outside world like he was, but she was also harassed by the Beatles for being ugly and by the mole for not being as intelligent as him. Even though his life experience was completely limited to being underground, and he actually didn't know shit about how things worked on the surface. And similar to the kids and professors who were critical of Anderson for being ugly and stupid, their words, not mine, these characters couldn't see past their own limited worldview to realize that different doesn't mean bad, it just means different. You might remember the cat and chicken characters from The Ugly Duckling showing the same attitude towards Uggo because he couldn't lay eggs or meow, which apparently are the two most valuable skills one can have. Now, in my opinion, I think Anderson's observations of dating life also manifested themselves in the form of the arranged marriages where Thumbelina didn't want to end up with the toad or the mole, but almost got suckered into it because of overzealous individuals telling her that it was for the best. Like how the field mouse told her she was lucky that the smart, rich mole wanted to marry her, and how she almost resigned herself to that horrible fate. But then she took her life into her own hands, said that vile creature is not for me, and as a result, met her fairy prince when she least expected it. I feel that because Anderson struggled romantically and was passed up for guys like the mole and toad, who back in those days, women might have been forced to commit to because of their parents, who valued very different traits than they did, that this was his way of sending a message to the little girls who would go on to read Thumbelina. That message being that no matter what people are telling you, and no matter how practical a relationship may be, don't settle for what you know you don't want because your Prince Charming is out there waiting for you. I don't know for sure, I could be reaching with that one, but it was my attempt at analysis. Solo fam, that is all I have got for you today, so now it's time for me to ask, what did you think of the original story? Personally, I really enjoyed it, but I'm always curious to hear your unique thoughts, so make sure you comment them down below. When you're through with that, hit like, subscribe if you haven't already, and share this video with anyone you know who might enjoy it. As always, the links to my social media are down below. Even though I generally suck at social media, I'd really appreciate it if you followed me. That way I can keep you updated on what projects are coming up next, what's going on with me in between uploads, and you can offer some suggestions. Gunther would also really appreciate a follow too, and do you really want to disappoint that face? He already kind of looks disappointed. In all serious solo fam, whether you do all of that or none at all, I just want to say thank you so much for watching, and I love you. Platonically. Until next time, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first. Thank you.